Hi, it's Roz here for my March wrap up and TBR um, for April video that I try to do towards the end of each month. And um, delights, discoveries, disappointments, any disasters, any DNFs, even not that I make a habit of that, and none this month. I um, I'm going to start though with two things that aren't books that I've read. They're more like bookish, bookish things, I suppose. One is, and I'm sure you will, some of you out there will understand this. I started this month with a feeling of tremendous bookish virtue. We had a good clear out, and all the things that were in random piles around the house are all now properly shelved, and everything's back in alphabetical order, or you know, grouped by topic, you know. And um, that was a lovely feeling. It did mean I had to get rid of a load of books. <sighs> which is always painful, but if I didn't do that at intervals, um, we would just disappear under the books in this house. Um, we have, we already have bookcases in every room. Uh, that's my thumbnail, um, I think, that I'm going to use for this video. And uh, and if you look at it and you think, oh, but that's a brilliant book, I really love that. First, you reassure that they've all gone to, they've all been rehomed successfully um, to be enjoyed by other people, which is, you know, what should happen with the book. But also, you know, I, I, lots of them are books that I absolutely loved when I read them. It's just you can't keep everything. And sometimes I try and keep like a, a representative book or two by a particular author or, or, or whatever, or things that I think I might have trouble getting hold of again, or um, that I'm not likely to want to sort of reread or, or lend out. And, but I may find what will happen is that I'll be doing one of those, um, booktube tags where it says you know uh, what's a book with whatever in it or whatever on the cover or you know and I'll think oh yeah I've got one of those and I'll go and look for it and of course I won't have it because it's been in my clear out pile but hey such is life that be brings me to the second bookish thing that I wanted to say in this video which is a huge huge thank you to everyone who's done the tag about tags and um, book tag that I've kicked off earlier this month. I've really enjoyed it because I was genuinely thinking a lot about tags and how we do them and why we do them and, and, and how we feel about them and, and that was what prompted me to do the tag and so I've really enjoyed people's answers. If you've done it and I haven't seen it and commented please let me know because I've tried to find them all but it's not fail safe the search function so um, but I would love to know if you have and I haven't noticed. I've enjoyed all the answers I've been I've found it useful and instructive hearing about people's systems for um doing tags remembering tags tagging people um you you spreadsheet doers out there you have my awe and admiration but the most useful tip for me was um Kim of middle of the bookmark she said she she just shoves all the tag videos that she's either things she's tagged in or things she just thinks she'd really like to do into a playlist her the watch later playlist and i thought yeah that's a really simple technique that I, can, I can do that and get in less of a less of a get more organized about about tags i yeah so thank you for that it's, it's a lot of amazing tags going around at the moment and uh, but i'm trying to make sure i make more videos that aren't tags than the videos that are if you know what i mean yeah <laughs> perhaps failing at the moment we'll see one of the things that I said I would try and do this year is is do more reading no not let my reading be sort of led by the nose by readathons and so on I really like the sort of readathons and read-alongs and group reads that the booktube generates I think it's one of its strong points you know like tags you know it's one of those community building things and so on but sometimes that means that then I don't get to things other things that I really wanted to do so I'm trying to use them to to read things that I wanted to read anyway it would be meaning to read or to yeah inspire me to um read something a bit different from what I would would have read you know so right as opposed to following them in great detail this month though I really have to thank um the March of the Mammoths host because they got me to pick up Kristen Lavranstatter again and that is a uh Norwegian classic um, published between 1921 and 1923 by Sigrid Unset. It's um, historical fiction, so it's old historical fiction. So she was writing it in the 1920s about the 1320s in Norway. Lovely detail. Um, yeah, really good. I, oh, if you're going to read it, get hold of the Tina Nunnally translations because. Um, they're much more in the style uh you know she used quite contemporary norwegian language and so on and the other translation you can get is 
quite archaic, which isn't how she intended it to be. You know, she wants us to meet these 14th century um, Norwegians as real people, people like us, not people that talk in sort of funny old fashioned language. It's three books in one. It's long. I've now read books one and two and I will get to book three um, before next March of the Mammoths comes round, if that makes yeah, to make sure I'm I'm, I'm fulfilling, I've, I've not failed in my, yes, in, our, in, our, in, in, in the goal. Uh, and I want to read it. And yeah, I know that Christine Laverenstetter is a particular favourite of Jason of Old Blue's chapter and verse, who's one of the Mammoth's hosts, so it felt very appropriate. It also worked as a book for another of March's um, readathons, which is March of the Moderns, because it was written, as I say, in the 1920s. Now, this is hosted by Margaret Pienaar. She's done a grand job of that. Um, she was getting us to read things published between 1901 and 1945, which is such it's quite a broad period and a really interesting one. And one when writing changed a lot, particularly the impact of those, those the, the First World War, I would say, um, had quite an impact on writing in lots of different countries in the world. But certainly I'm most aware of it in the British Isles. I actually went off on a bit of a, a tangent with this because um, I was given two books recently that, that fitted the time period, Summer Lightning by P.G. Woodhouse and um, Much Dithering by um, Dorothy Lambert. And they are both humorous books. And so I've actually uh, made a video which is about the fact that this was quite a golden age of um, humorous writing, certainly in the British Isles. Um, and so thank you, Tilly and Sean, for giving me the books that prompted that. And yeah, if you'd like some recommendations of good humorous British writing um, from that period, go to my video. Interestingly, it was also a great period for um, mystery writing and March is also March Mystery Madness, and I, I slightly neglected that one, but maybe next March I shall enjoy doing that. Although one of my Booktube Prize books did fit the bill for that, um, which was um, Jim Patrol and the Purple Line. Now, I should say swiftly now that, yes, I read three books this month, which I'm not talking about in this video because they were for the Booktube Prize, um, which slightly sort of distorts my sort of Delights Discoveries kind of um, logic for this. Um, but... I will be doing, I've done a video about all six of my Booktube Bribes books, which I will put up after the that the results of that round are announced. So I won't talk about any of them here. So when I originally thought of March of the Moderns, what naturally came to mind was the sort of modernist writers. Um, and so although I went off on a, on a comedy thing, um, I did also want to read um, an author that, that, kind of fitted that bag as well for um for for, for march of the moderns and what i did was i took the opportunity to read a book by a uh, collection by marianne moore um her um her selected poems from 1935 because she is a modernist poet who was very much on a par with T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound and so on. But certainly in the UK, she doesn't get the same attention that, say, Eliot would. I mean, partly perhaps because he lived here, but also, I think, because she's a woman writer. And um, so I was filling a gap, I suppose, in, in my reading experience by, by reading a book of hers. She was a very intriguing character if you read about her life a bit um I mean I guess she described her as a queer writer I think if she were living now she might sort of say she was asexual uh, yeah eccentric interesting um her poems are intellectually very stimulating they didn't kind of I don't know you know how sometimes you you read poetry and it just sort of grabs you in a in a uh, in whatever way more didn't do that for me now i discovered after i'd finished reading it that she um that was a criticism she it was a criticism made of her poetry at the time that it lacked emotion and she did so quite, quite a strong riposte to that and you know she said that sometimes our strongest emotions are best expressed through silence and that i'd almost like to go back and reread the book in the light of 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 if, if that was her 
thought and intention. There's some really lovely poems in the collection um, that are sort of that draw on the natural world. Um, and that's which is something that I really enjoy in poetry. The other poet that I read this this month, which I'll talk about later on, does that as well. That's um, Evan Boland, Irish poet. Um, he, he does it. Hughes does it. Yeah, it, it's a yeah something. Um, uh, Alice, oh, I've forgotten her surname. The dot. It'll come back to me. Oswald, Alice Oswald. She does it. Kathleen, Jamie. Yeah, I, it's something I really like in 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 poetry. So a good collection, but it didn't sort of set me a light. I was glad also though to have read her because one of the things that she did when before she was kind of well known as a poet was she was very much involved in the American suffrage movement and so she was a very appropriate poet to read in Women's History Month. Also with sort of Women's History Month in, in mind, um, Tilly for our this month's discussing drama were looking for a poet, a, a playwright who um, wrote in the in the sort of march of the moderns period um and would be yes uh, so uh, had a sort of uh women's history sort of twist i suppose and courtney ferreter kindly recommended susan glassbell and trifles now what a brilliant recommendation tilly and i made a video obviously uh, uh, so i won't talk about the play in any detail but it was really great for me to read a pioneering American feminist writer that I hadn't read before and she was also a pioneer of the um, modern American theatre so yeah again I felt like oh, that's a like a, a gap in my in my history um, reading history filled I like doing that um, uh, there was a bit of a conversation going around a little while back about book snobbery and it's it's not like and saying well you shouldn't read things just because you ought to but there's something about reading things that yes fill the gaps in your literary jigsaw and I, I do try and do that whether in terms of different countries different periods di writing different writing traditions I'm loving reading at the moment um Dante's Divine Comedy with Tom L.A. Books and a group of booktubers um you know for that reason and and yeah I don't apologize for wanting to do that I suppose so the other thing that I try, yeah, I see, I'm, a, I'm earnest. Sometimes I'm earnest about my reading. I try to read a non-fiction book every month because if I don't consciously say to myself, what's your non-fiction book this month, Roz? I might let months go by without reading any non-fiction. I'm, you know, I'm more of a fiction, fiction baby. My non-fiction choice, I looked for a book of women's history by a woman historian and that, and I picked um, The Common Garden Ladies by Hallie Rubenhold, um, published in 2005. It was based on um, something called Harris's List. Harris's List was a bestseller in Britain, in London. Um, in every year it was published between 1957, uh, <laughs> not 19, 1757 and 1795. And it is a list of, it's purportedly at least, the that year's... Um, sex workers, women sex workers working in London um, and, you know, their different identities, what they look like, their um, skills and um, what tastes they cater for. It was meant to, the idea was, was that you could kind of read it and think, oh yeah, I'd really like to look out, you know, Fanny Hughes, she sounds like my kind of prostitute. Um, I think it was probably primarily used as an aid to masturbation, in fact, you know, <laughs> but... Um, who knows, I suspect. Reuben Hull tries to draw out the lives of those women and the, the world that they were living in. You know, that's George, we're talking George in London at a time when London was growing fast. There was lots of riches, but there was also extreme poverty. Um, sex work was one of the um, few ways that women could perhaps, you know, deal with finding themselves in, in a position of poverty. It might all then some women would then flourish through that and maybe even find their way into sort of um uh, prosperity and 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 uh, uh marry well or be a you know well off mistress or whatever and others ended up um you know diseased and destitute the whole spectrum of of, of georgian london life is in this book S two slight disappointments about it one was that it focuses as much on two men as the women involved um 
Jack Harris, who was the titular author of Harris's List, but didn't really write it, uh, but was a sort of well-known pimp, basically. Um, and uh, Samuel Derrick, who did actually write the the write the book. Um, and again, interesting character. But the only only one out of the three sort of main people that feature in the book um, who was actually uh, a Covent Garden lady herself was Charlotte Hayes and we get her life history and, and from being born in a brothel through being a sex worker being a um, brothel keeper herself and 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 achieving wealth but not social acceptance I suppose I'll I would have liked more about the women, but I think, you know, Ruben Holt said she, she was really at the mercy of her sources and she did the best that she could. Um, the other thing, complaint I had about the book was there wasn't enough kind of footnotes and referencing, but again, she said that was that was the choice of her publisher and not her. So um, I would certainly read another book of popular history by Hallie Ruben Holt, possibly The Five, which a lot of people have recommended about Jack the Ripper's um, identified um, female victims, um, their lives and kind of you know she likes to try and pull the sort of anonymous women out of history and 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 honor them and and talk about them and that's uh i can i'm happy to get behind that um so that was women's history month another of the month's events is um the irish readathon now i i failed to get on board with Jewathon, which is the welsh readathon and maybe this time next year i'll read a load of welsh books but i actually kind of did really get into um some irish writing this month which was lovely um i actress one of my book two prize books is by Anne enright really fine irish novelist um one of the march of the moderns books i mentioned um much dithering by dorothy lambert she's an anglo-irish author although that's set in england so it, it didn't really kind of hit the spot for for an Irish readathon. One thing that did was I read Good Behaviour by Molly Keane. Molly Keane is interesting because um, she came from the sort of um, Anglo-Irish upper classes um, and grew up in that world, wrote books under a pseudonym kind of secretly because, you know, what you were supposed to enjoy was like hunting and shooting and fishing and, and that sort of thing and not books and writing so but she she wanted to make a bit of money so she did books on the side she had had a long gap and then she came back and published um good behavior in mm, 1980 it was like a late late life book and the first one that she actually published under her own name molly Keane. and she writing it she draws on her anglo irish childhood and and young adulthood um to write a dark and funny book if you read elizabeth burns last september it's not as good as that it's not as political you know bowen it gives you a lot of hints about what was happening in ireland um in terms of like the you know civil war and so on um keen skates over that but she does she's writing about the kind of the the decline of the anglo-irish um upper classes as they became an irrelevance and an embarrassment i suppose and uh yeah really enjoyed the book great fun my other very successful irish read no well two more but the other one that i finished was um i took the opportunity again at the irish readathon to read a book of poetry by an irish woman poet one of the kind of big names of irish poetry of the 20th century that i i never read and that's Evan Boland. Evan or even? I'm not sure. I should have checked. Um, this book, The Historians, was published in 2020, not long after her, her death in, at the beginning of the year. It um, was the culmination, the last book, of a kind of mm, 50 to 60 year um, history as a writer uh, and a writer of poetry. What a good book. She... She, I think, all through her career, kind of made a positive choice to bring the world, the lives of Irish women into her poetry, you know, the domestic sphere, and yet still be saying um, something, yeah, well, I suppose, yes, honouring that and treating it as a significant subject and something that tells you things about Ireland and, uh, yeah, that it doesn't all have to be about... Um, yeah, the male players, you know, or those themes. It, yeah, 
also beautifully writes beautifully about things like the weather the landscape um the natural world around her you can tell i really like these poems um the whole collection i found really satisfying and it hung together well as um as a collection of poetry yeah i would definitely definitely a strong recommendation it's there's a real skill isn't there to writing something that appears quite simple and clear and straightforward and actually has a lot of deeper layers yeah that's something that i value in a poet hmm. the other the final irish book that i'm reading i it's where i'm kind of squeezing in at the end of the month um and that's big girl small town by michelle gallon also published in 2020 it's a novel um uh, it, it has been like a lovely buzz about it on booktube from and it's been enjoyed by people whose opinion I respect so I thought I'd just squeeze that one in so I'm part way through that but I will finish it before the end of the month so that's a kind of whistle stop tour through most of my month's reading what am I going to read in April well I'm going to do Saga Long as I said um read N Null Saga um I'll link to that below um some of the announcement videos for that April is Aussie April and I'm going to take the opportunity of that to read um, Tara June Winch's um, book, The Yield. I've read quite a lot of Australian literature, but not a lot of Indigenous Australian authors. So um, I'm making good that gap. Uh, Adam Bede by George Eliot. There's a there's an Eliot 2021 group and I'm sort of it's working its way through reading a lot of Eliot over the course of the year and I'm hopping hopping on that train uh, in April to read one that I haven't yet read and I'm really looking forward to that. Um, uh, Mermaid of Black Conch. That's my that's a book that I suggested to my real life um book group so i hope they enjoy it um it's always a bit of a risk i've talked about this before with my with my real life book group of whether books that i fancy reading whether they'll also enjoy but i hope it's going to be one of the ones that is in the sweet pot spot that that appeals to a broad group we'll see um what else oh there's another readathon that i just picked up on just in time before it was too late to plan it into my um, month's reading and that is Lit with Indian Lit. Um, now the host for that is um, Spriti um, of now what's her channel name? Saint Saint Reads, I think. I'll I'll put it below, and it's um, encouraging us to read Indian literature that was written um, in one of the various languages used around India, not originally in English. A lot of Indian authors write in English. Um, obviously, it means, you know, it's, you get a sort of international audience more readily. And it's a common language, you know, used across India. But that means that sometimes we miss out on some of those books in translation from India. Um, and so that's her, that's her motivation. And I'm going to read one of her recommendations, which is Lifting the Veil by Ismat Chuktai, um, an Urdu writer um, from early 20th century. I'm really looking forward to that that's my that's my month tell me about your highlights of of the month gone and um if there's anything that i'm planning on reading that you're also planning on reading i would love to hear so that maybe we can we can plan to chat about it happy uh happy end of march everyone